Well, hi. <laughs> My name is Manny Lariano. I play first trumpet with the Minnesota Orchestra, and I'm here to talk to you about music. Um, but before we do that, I see there are a lot of folks in the back. Um, I know you, you want to probably make an exit at some point. Don't worry, I won't be offended, but I would love it if you would move forward. We've got all kinds of little cards and things like that that are actually going to be important uh, later on. Uh, let me get my script so I know what I'm actually saying. There we go. Well, y'all are cooperative. Most of the time, people just kind of stay where they are. That's great. Well, again, uh, thank you so much for, for coming. First of all, it's 9 o'clock in the morning. What are you doing here? <laughs> it's, uh, it, it's, it's kind of an odd time to be having a talk about um, trumpet and all that sort of thing. I mean, but here we are. Um, what is this whole thing going to be about? We are all in the business of expressing ourselves musically. In order to do that, we need tools. We have to have our technique and tools the way that we do things. Plumbers have lead pipes or whatever kind of pipes they're using, copper, whatever. Um, carpenters have wood and nails and screws and, and all that stuff. We, on the other hand, have this, which was probably made by a plumber a long time ago. And it comes along with a lot of little issues that we have to kind of uh, circumvent before we can use these tools to actually make some kind of music. One of the things that I talk to students about a lot is the importance of listening to, to really, really good um, examples of, of great artists and all that. We need to pay attention to the lessons that we learn on the stand, or in orchestras, in bands as we're coming up. Let me ask you a question. Does anybody happen to have a copy of the Arden book with them? Do you, can I hold it for a second? There's something that I want to read to you from the Arden book that I'll bet you anything. Thank you so much. I'll bet you anything you've never um, read before. Yeah. Okay. It is the last part, the part just before, I mean, the way they constructed this, they put everything kind of at the end. But just before the, the studies and the solos and the variations and all that stuff, I've been writing something and he talks about the last part. And I'll bet you anything that there's probably of maybe five people in this room that have actually read this, but it is the most important thing that he writes in the entire book. So listen to this. I'll read it in English. <laughs> At this point, my task as professor, employing, as I do now, the written word instead of the spoken word, will end. There are things which appear clear enough when uttered viva voce, but which cannot be committed to paper. Without engendering confusion and obscurity, or without appearing puerile. Puerile is like overly fussy. There are things of so elevated and subtle a nature that neither speech nor writing can clearly con explain them. They are felt, they are conceived, but they are not to be explained. And yet, these things constitute the elevated style, the grand decor, which it is my ambition to institute for the even as they already exist for singing and various other kinds of instruments. 
So what he was basically saying at this point is that, you know, you court, you cornet players who actually used to play horn and are not getting enough um, employment, and so you took up the cornet. Y'all got problems. <laughs> and that's why he wrote the book, is to give us a way to do things just the way that the singers and, and the great flute players and the violins and all the great singers and all that, just like they have. Such of my readers as may wish to arrive at this exalted pitch of perfection should, above all things, endeavor to hear good music well interpreted. They must seek out amid singers and instrumentalists the most illustrious models. And this practice, having purified their taste, developed their instruments, and brought them as near as possible to the beautiful, may perhaps reveal to them the innate spark which may someday be destined to illumine their talent and to render them worthy of being in turn cited and imitated in the future. Thank you so much for being prepared. <laughs> <laughs> so that is huge. I mean, the Orban's book is, is kind of biblical for us. This is, I mean, this is, I mean, after I read that, I felt like saying, okay, now go to your hymnals. <laughs> <laughs> For us, but that is the most important thing that he writes in the entire book. That there are things, after my having given you all the studies on triple tonguing and on slurs and, and all of this stuff and the art of phrasing and all that, after that, you're on your own. You've got to listen to great artists. And I was blessed with listening to just so many great artists of different styles, and they made me, be between them and my teachers, they made me the player that I am, for better or worse, that's what it was. It was the first time that I listened to a, to a recording with Rafael Mendez, and I, the only trumpets I heard were the, the kids in school next to me, and, and my teacher, uh, Jimmy Smith, at the time, and Jimmy was a gorgeous player. But when uh, Mr. Jose Rodriguez from Apartment 7D came over and said, here, I think you should have this report because I've been playing a couple of years. And I sat down, the first thing I heard was the Loch Ness Bell song. Oh, yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> and I remember putting it on the big console and I sat there and said, okay, let's see what this is. And I listened to this sound and I can literally remember my mouth dropping over at hearing this, you know? And then that, of course, led to a lifetime of not listening just to Raphael, but eventually Maurice Andre, and then hearing other instrumentalists play, and finding out what these people have in common. What is it that they did? And then, of course, going to Juilliard and Bacchiano saying, all this stuff you've been listening to is crap. This is the way to do it. <laughs> <laughs> and of course, he had great respect for all those players, but he was making a point. He was saying, on to the next chapter. You're now going to learn to be an orchestral musician. You're now going to learn to be somebody who has to learn all of the musical things that you need. I'm going to give you certain kinds of tools to be able to play along with other people, and that is what this session is about. Normally it's like, okay, you play pictures, I make a position this way, and it's like, you know, I, I've done enough of those. This is now about something that is incredibly important, and it's about playing with other people. So that's what this session is all about. Now, sometimes when we start getting all of this advice, we get very confused. The more we go through our experiences by playing by ourselves with other people, because, as I just said, I started with Rafael Mendez and then more and more and more. And your brain has to kind of sort out what you need. And that's what happened with me at Juilliard. I came in with a, with a, with a bunch of uh, information and Mr. Vacchiano helped me kind of take what I needed in order to do what I was pursuing. Um, so I don't get to play like Rafael Mendez much 
in the in the orchestra, except when we do um, a piece like Wapango. Or something like that. Do you all know this piece? Ah, oh, it's it's wonderful. It, it, it's it's it's, a, it's it's like we have the stars and stripes. The Mexicans have Wapango. This is this is the piece that you hear at the end of of, of all the. The, the concerts. It's one of those uh, wonderful characteristic pieces. So, our teachers must may say things to us that don't make a lot of sense the first time we hear it, and it bears kind of just repeating and experiencing it. And then one day the light goes on. In in martial arts, um, we have the expression: when the student is ready, the teacher appears. And even though you've heard something over and over and over, when you are ready to understand it, that's when the light bulb goes on. This subject is huge because of the sheer amount of music that we're responsible to play. Even me in the orchestra, like I say, we're playing lots and lots more different kinds of music, and we have to know how to play all that stuff right. So we, so we really do have to listen. If you play jazz, you are required to at the very least have a working knowledge of all the current and present styles and past styles of jazz music and the music that preceded that, like spirituals, etc. If you're a classical player and either play in an orchestra or wish to play in an orchestra, you also have a huge list of things you need to learn or continue to learn. Did I know now, what I, did I know then, the things that I know now when I first started out? Of course not. I and others will tell you that what you learn on the job is a huge part of what distinguishes you as a good player, a great player, or a great musician. And this is really important because remember, when you're in an orchestra, you've got, it's not an orchestra made up of eight trumpet players, God help you. <laughs> it's made up of, 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 of 80 to 100 musicians, all with varying sounds. Sometimes we stand out, sometimes we have to blend in, and we have to figure out how to do that. Um, like I said, I read the other thing. So you need to aspire to becoming a great musician, but that takes an enormous amount of work. You need to listen to performances that not only inspire you to play better, but that also teach you something along the way. I'm going I'm to read that again. You need to listen to performances that not only inspire you to play better, but that also teach you something along the way. And in order to be taught by these things that we hear, we have to be listening. There's hearing and there's listening. The hearing is the first time, but then we have to have repeated listening. That's why recording is, oh good lord. Um, when I was at Juilliard, I don't think there was a day where I wasn't up in the listening library checking out. I mean, I, I lived in New York, so so you know, I, I just like lived and died by the recordings of William Bakian. And then somebody introduced me to this first set guy that lived in Chicago, <laughs> <laughs> and that was a whole whole nother thing. So everything starts to expand. And then uh, Mr. Boisin in, in in Boston and he's Holland all of these wonderful things and trying to reconcile what I was learning at the time and what I liked, what worked for me, what I was able to, to put into, uh, to apply. Uh, like that day at, at rehearsal, I was the, uh, I was the 10 o'clock guy, Monday morning, 10 o'clock, I, I would have my lesson with Mr. Bakke and I was the first one, so I, was, I always showed up at about 9.30 because he would already be in the room and warming up. And I just, listening to him warm up was, was, an, was a lesson all by itself. And then a couple of minutes before 10, right there, right there, right here, sir. Um, so one of the first things that we have to understand is that there is a right way to play things. That is rarely said these days because we live during a time where everybody's right and nobody's wrong. Well, if that's true, then we students of William Pacchiano didn't know what we were doing while we were busy going about the task of getting work and winning auditions at that, at that time. Now, when I say there's a right way, does that mean that there's an only way? No. What it means is that 
we have learned along the way these rules, that there are certain things that you do, I don't care who you study with, there are certain things that you do musically when you sit down as I did my first year in Seattle, a friend of mine, who was a fiddle player, said, oh, I'm going to go play for, for an old folks home. Um, do you want to come along and we can play some duets? And I said, oh, what a nice idea. What do you want to play? He said, well, I have the Bach double. OK. <laughs> so I put a cup mute in, you know, and I'm playing up in the high knees and things like that. And, and all. But it wasn't about that. It wasn't about that. It was about trying to blend and play like the fiddle player was. Having my phrasing match her bowing, <laughs> making sure that, that when she played for a strong beat and then I imitated, that I imitated the same way from the same beat, that I did not allow the trumpet to dictate how I was going to play. That I did not allow the trumpet and its eccentricities and its physical demands to dictate how I was going to phrase. You have to be the master here. You cannot be a slave to what the trumpet decides you should be doing. This is, if you leave with any other concept from here, it is that. You have to get past whatever the physical demands and problems are of the instrument to make sure that what you're doing is playing things so musically correct, I'll put that in little air quotes, correct, that if you play with a flute player, if you play with a violinist, if you play with a bass player, that you are on the same wavelength. You all get that? This is really, really important. Of course, interpretations vary. But what I'm really saying is that there are rules of phrasing that always need to be observed in their proper context. Now, I guess I do have to play. I, was, I really wasn't planning playing. I just kind of had to see just the whole, just to prove I actually do play this thing. But one of the things that I, I, I talked about uh, the, the Boeing business. Um, everybody look back there and watch Charlie Schluter because I'm about to make him smile. <clears throat> All my parts, my excerpt books, are for Don Juan are marked with Bowie. And the very first uh, part is I can guarantee you, if we were to go into Charlie's library, he would have the same mark, because that's how Bacchiano would mark it. He would mark them with Bowie, so we would know strong weak, things like that. Here I just talk about, but here, you don't accept uh, a weak beat. Weak beat being like, da, 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 da. no, Bacchiano, the very first time that I came in for a lesson with him, I played the, the um, Vasily Brandt concert piece. 
Now remember, this is my first lesson, okay? It's my first lesson. And we've gone through all of this stuff. Everybody's first lesson with Akiyam is exactly the same. We've all got this, the same faith. Then at the very end, um, he saw that I, I brought this, and he said, oh, okay, go ahead, play this thing. It's been a while, and I've never done it on C trumpet, though. Accenting all the weak beds, and he went, No! <laughs> literally, literally, his hand went, No! And he started talking about, about just how musically barbaric what I was doing. <laughs> <laughs> Charlie, am I kidding? Is, is, is that? No, see? <laughs> that's, 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 I want to recognize my dear, dear colleague and friend, Charlie Schluter, principal of the Performance end of a long note. And you hear there are a couple of violin solos here that you can kind of just don't ask them for advice. They get very excited and they'll, and they'll do that stuff. Don't do that. Don't do that. I mean, unless maybe if you're playing a Shostakovich symphony and, 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 and there's something with, with an accent mark, but just in general, avoid that. Let's try not to do that. Watch for your dynamics, trumpet players. Watch your dynamics, they're really interesting. <laughs> and, and, they, and, and they, believe it or not, in, in some ways they, they make the music a little easier to, to play, but, but do, do be really observant about little things like that. Those are the things when you do when you play by yourself. Imagine the responsibilities when you're looking at playing with someone else or, an entire se or in an entire section. How about when you're the section leader? When you're in the second, what if you're second? What if you're third? What if you're fourth? Each person has different responsibilities, but they're the same. They have different responsibilities in terms of what their, their job is, in terms of how brilliant the low register has to be, that sort, of, that sort of thing. So we're going to attempt to answer a lot of questions as we listen to some clips from my colleagues, uh, of my colleagues from across the country playing several of the excerpts that you've studied and played, and I figure and figure out what is it that makes a section sound good. All right. So a principal player has a huge role. And that person decides by virtue of the position how things are going to go. <clears throat> Think of the principal player as the, uh, the job supervisor. Okay, has to make sure that everything is going along to what they're getting from the podium. In other words, you know how at the UN, whenever we, we see these, uh, somebody's giving a speech, and everybody else from different countries, they have on the headphone, and there's somebody going, as fast as they possibly can, listening to what the person's doing, and they are translating simultaneously. <coughs> When we're sitting in the principal chair, we have the unenviable job of translating what a conductor is doing. You know, it isn't easy. It's not always easy. It's, it's, it's a lot of times it has to do with, with the conductor's technique. Sometimes they speak in very, very flowery ways, and you've got to kind of cut through all that and figure out what this, what this, there was a great moment I heard the story from, from Bob Cernick. Uh, there was some young conductor that they had. Uh, they had never seen him before. It looked like he was about 25. And he was conducting them in a fall now. Don't know what opera it was. But at one point, he turns to, to the brass. He says, brass, it sounds very good, but I, I need a certain quality of sound. It needs to be. And he kept searching for it. It, it, it's, it, 
it, it must be, it, it has to have a burnished quality. At which point the guys were, oh, burnished, burnished, oh. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, they're young, they learn. <laughs> you know. But we do kind of figure out what's, what's going on. And then we use our tools to decide how we're going to, uh, how we're going to, to do all of that. Sometimes it is done by example. Sometimes it's done by explaining directly. Now, I'll tell you something about my audition. When I got the job here, um, I was playing against four marvelous players. Uh, Wilmer Wise, who Wilmer Wise, who wonderful uh, uh, in New York. Larry Weeks, may God rest his soul. I um, was playing first trumpet in, in Toronto. Uh, John Ailey, who now uh, at the University of Madison, and my friend for life, John Rochelle, by whom I love John. So we were all playing for the, the same position. And the one piece, one of the pieces on, uh, on uh, playing with the orchestra, I'm sorry, I didn't even mention to you. I played with the brass section the, the night before at, at a church, just, just me and the rest of the brass, playing through a red surf and some things. The next morning I had to play with uh, the entire orchestra, and then after that would be a stand-up audition. But when I was playing with the orchestra, one of the pieces that we played was Fet of, 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 of what we see. And so, all I had to do was think about what I had been taught by Mr. Macchiato. And just, just said, be very precise about the rhythm. Ba -ba, ba -ba -ba -ba, ba -ba -ba -ba. And so we got to that part, the part, and just put it there. After I had gotten the job, I had a nice uh, cup of coffee with uh, my new section mate, Ron, section mate, Ron Hansel. And he said to me, one of the reasons that you stood out was because of the precision that you used to play these, these sixteenths. Wrong or right, I had an idea. See what I'm saying? So whether it's, it's, it's the way that you see said that you stood out precisely, if you want to admit, I don't know. But that's the way that I decided I was going to do. That's the way I led them. By example, I did not say to them, okay, we're going to do this 16th year of Alex Stravinsky very I did not have to. They're, they were good sections. They knew, they knew how to follow. Once I said it, that was it. So sometimes you lead just by example. Other times, you do have to just say a little something. You know, it, it, it can get that complicated. Then it's possible that once you've taken the players aside before the first rehearsal, maybe because something is particularly difficult, the conductor has completely different ideas. Your job in that case is not to make a scene and argue in front of the entire orchestra. In my 46 years of playing in Seattle, Minnesota, I have done that a handful of times. And trust me when I tell you, it does not end well. And most of the time I've regretted it. So, because we wound up doing what the conductor wanted and turned out he was right. I, I'll listen, heavy confession time, all right? So, I grew up hearing the Bernstein recording of America in Paris. Da 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 he said, no, actually, I don't want you to play it that way. I said, I, I need you to play it. Just play the accents right there. That's really more of what Gertrude wanted. I have some good authority from some very old sax players out in L.A. that actually played with Gertrude. And I was like, and, I, and the conductor was a friend of mine. I said, what, seriously? And he, he was right. I went and listened to a recording from 1928. It's exactly the way to play. And Gershwin was actually in the orchestra playing Telesco. So, sorry, the guy was wrong, the guy was wrong. <laughs> okay. So, you know, just choose, choose your battles. Um, 
The moral of these stories is be flexible. It makes you into a better reader. Also remember that at the other end of my musical life is conducting. I conduct, I'm the music director of the Symphony. I used to conduct the Minnesota Youth Symphony. I have the Metropolitan Symphony. So I know that incredulous look musicians give when they are told something and there's no way it could possibly be true. I went to the so-and-so school of musical arts and studied with Fanny McFamous, and there's no way I'm going to play that class of chocolate. Yeah, you are. <laughs> no. um, in order to make this recording that you, you get, did you guys get these things? These, uh, thank you. It's a nice year. Okay, yeah. wonderful. Yeah, you, you, you really, you really want to check this out later. I, after this, we're going to play a few examples. Not my favorite picture myself, but the other guys look great. <laughs> <laughs> um, let's see here. Where am I? Where am I? Where am I? Yeah, yeah. So for this project that that we had, uh, which is explained at the, at the website, a lot of planets have line up in order to have the section play well. In the case of my particular cohorts for these recordings, we happened to have a common thread, and that was William Bacchiano. Dave, Matt, and Jeff studied with Charlie Schluter, who's a Bacchiano student, and he and I both studied Bacchiano. So those common threads can be very helpful. However, <coughs> my current section, and I, I'm the only one that studied with Bacchiano. A lot of people studied. You've got to make the cake ingredients that you have in the cake, and the cake has to taste good, all right? There can't be too much flour. There can't be too much baking soda. You ever tasted a cake with too much baking soda? It's bad. I had that experience. Can't have too much frosting. I can't believe I'm saying that, but it can't have too much frosting, okay? It's got to be a nice balance, not only of sounds, but of ideas. But of ideas. Um, after that, uh, and then we all, uh, played Dave Monet's horn, so that was nice having that common thread. After that, there's an enormous amount of interest in playing effectively as an ensemble. We really wanted to play well, you know? Uh, while that may sound obvious, it can be fleeting. If we become too cloistered in our own selves when we're playing, it can be, we need to be, it's not good. We need to be hearing, accepting, adjusting. Everybody knows um, that in a major chord, the third is a little bit lower than it is in equal temperament. Well, what are you going to do if the first player is a little sharp? What if the first player is a little, sh a little flat and you're playing second or third? Are you going to hold forth on a stern lecture about where, to, where, where you have to put the note? Chances are that if you do, people will be more than happy to tell you where to put that note. <laughs> So obviously you have to adjust the slide a little, even if it's if it's lip. You know, you gotta it's gotta be about the music first. It's got to be about the music first. The same goes for you whether you're playing principal, by the way. This is really important for every player to have a, every principal player to have at least a nominal bit of knowledge about the notes that your colleagues, second, third, and fourth, have, not just your own. If you're playing the section, you have a question. Ask, don't you ever, 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 talking to students here, don't ever go past the first player if you have a question. You lean over, you say, Joe, Larry, this is such and such, what do you want to do? And then if the first player is not, well, that's a good question, that person asks. Don't ever do that, okay? Seriously. Always just speak cooperatively with collaboration as, you're, as what you're trying to do. Be honest about what needs to be done, but be friends. Be friends. It's just too easy to be friends with, with, your, with your colleagues in, in the section. Just build good relationships as people check your ego at the door and understand that the greater mission is communication to common goals to create music. These common goals are what began this recording project. What started as a bit of fun playtesting horns turned into a desire to play great music 
beautifully, with energy, with expression. What became the mission, as it were, was to play everything not only as well as we could, but in the right styles, to the best of our understanding. So, hey Brad, let's start with listening to a bit of Copeland. Now this is the fun, this is kind of the, the jock lick, I just thought I would we'd throw, this, <laughs> we'd throw this in there. It is, it is a lot of fun to play and listen to. This is a lick from the second movement of uh, Copeland's third symphony. There's a tremendous amount of unison and octave playing in there. Let's go a little bit further. Um, this takes a tremendous amount of self-knowledge of what I call the intonation inventory. You have to know what notes are out of tune on your instrument. If you want to be that flexible musician that people enjoy playing with in a section, that people enjoy playing with under you as the, the leader, Make sure that you have a good operating understanding of what notes are sharp, what notes are flat. If there are compensations you have to make with fingerings, great. If you need to, to kind of uh, uh, have a better understanding of a new mouthpiece, whatever equipment, figure it out. Figure it out. And try and make your times on the stand in the orchestra times where you have command of your instrument and you know how your instrument is going to respond. Also, you have to be strong to sustain. If you're playing principle on something like that, um, your body must, you must be more than just about the lip per se. The body tires as much of the lips, as much as the lips, if you are not working efficiently. The body tires as much as the lips if you are not working efficiently. Moreover, your colleagues must be in line with all of that in order to create a musical, stylistically characteristic message. You know, um, our European friends love to, uh, when, when they hear things, they go, ah, oh, American style. And they, they hear something that really kind of typifies this, and I'm not afraid of that, because when we hear the Berlin Philharmonic play a Brahms symphony, this is coming from a, a group of Germans who are very, very, very well ensconced into, into the German song, and it's an education to listen to them every time. So, now in this next session, you're going to hear these un uh, more, more unisons and then breaking out into harmonies. Let's take a listen to see what we achieve in terms of uh, the overtones that we hear, Brad.
Now, for those of you that don't know the piece, I know there are several people who know the piece. Those of you who don't know the piece probably think that that's a four trumpet section. It's not three. But you are hearing constantly at least four different sounds in, in, a, in a given chord. Some of that happened really, I have to say, really quite naturally. It's, it's not like we are, okay, we really got to play this in tune. It just sort of happened. And this is the big point that I've been trying to make, is that when people have the same goals in mind, things like that do happen. It, 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 that's what made it such a marvelous experience. And that's why we were able to do various, various takes and not feel quite so tired, because I think it, it's, it's only efficient playing that helps you uh, achieve something like that. So uh, that was a lot of fun um, to, to record. Now, um, let's do something completely different, but just the same. Let's um, play the opening chorale from Brahms' Academic Overture. He wrote it in such a way that the overtones produced by the trumpets appear in what he wrote for other instruments in the brass section. In other words, there are several chords where you, well, there's one, I think there's an F major chord in the way that it's, no, excuse me, it, 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 I need to, to check my stuff a little bit better. But there's one particular chord where an A in the staff, the one we tuned to, is not written, yet there it is. And, principal trombone has the same note. So such was Brahms' genius that he was able to write notes that would appear in overtones as well as, as in instruments. Let's first hear the chorale. Oh, well, we'll hear the, the, you know, the whole thing. this excerpt ad nauseum together. But this is kind of a call and response, isn't it? Because you play that opening theme, and then people have to join you. They can't just join you mindlessly. They have to fit into the style that you have just set over two measures of 5-4 of and 6-4. They have to play the same way. So uh, let's listen to, to this opening uh, for pictures.
Okay. And, <laughs> okay. I'm sorry. I didn't communicate some things that I should have to Brad. What I wanted was was also the, the final corral in the Brahma. It doesn't matter. It's once again. Listen, you'll get the rest. Just consider that a tease. <laughs> um, so the great game is, is one where you have to find incredible unanimity. Now I want you to listen for not only the, the intonation, but I want you to also listen for the triplet phrase. You know, at the very those rising triplets that go up. There are various interpretations of how to do it. This is how, when it's played in the Minnesota Orchestra, this is how I, I lead it so that um, the guys can play. Conductors don't complain about volume when stuff is in tune. Oh, now I've got your interest, don't I? <laughs> so what, you, what, what did you say? When you play in tune, conductors, they might just look at you and just kind of go, as you like that, you know? But they, well, you won't get anything. <laughs> you know? So. <laughs> That's, that's really important. They, they get off on it. They really <coughs> enjoy hearing it. Their brass section, the brass section they own, just playing things in just a ringing sound. They almost hate the bottom. But as long as, oh, the other thing too, as long as it's balanced. If it's balanced and in tune, even if it's got a little juice to it, a lot of times they won't bother you about it. They'll just kind of look back and go, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> see what we've got. Um, oh, this is kind of important too. Uh, we've heard things uh, in, in, we've heard American music, we've heard Russian music. Let's, let's do a little bit more um, of the German stuff, but more, even more specifically, the music of, of Bruckner. Let me just check my time here. Okay, so, I'm, I think I'm done with this. Well, guess what, I'm going to be done. Okay. Um, yeah, let's play a little bit of this uh, Bruckner, which requires a broader tongue, very flowing lines, um, at the, and at the front of the pack is less, flows like water, right?
So we have the attacks necessary to create the notes, but not that punchy quality per se. It's 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 there, it's present, but not necessarily punchy. Hey, um, Brad, let's do this. I, I want to move ahead a, a little bit. Why don't we go ahead to the um, the scherzo stuff, the, the stuff in, in the third movement? Can we go ahead? Okay. Yeah. Um, so now this is, sorry, this is from the from the scherzo, which what I want you to listen for is um, the timing, and now the attack's going to be a slightly different. for you um, is the end chorale from um, Mahler, the, the chorale and then a little bit of, of the very end, because the overtones were so rich I just couldn't resist not playing it for you, I couldn't resist playing it for you. Um, Mahler really requires a lot of us, high, every player, every player has to be able to play high, low, loud, louder, soft, softer. Angrily, tenderly, resigned, triumphant. Ultimately, you must play with great attention to what Mahler asks for. This is uh, a couple of excerpts from the finale of the Third Symphony, the famous chorale that ends. Is that what we got? Yes. Yes, absolutely.
So that's what all this has been about. Using our tools, using our hearts, using our brains to work together when we are in a section. What I'm hoping on all this is that if you during the <clears throat> during this conference have a few moments and you see a buddy, you say, hey, let's get the Army book, let's get the St. Jacob book, like the Boyle's book, whatever, let's go play some duets. That would be the best way to honor whatever it is that I've said that might have had an effect on you today. Because I really consider all of this stuff to be of supreme importance for anybody who is considering a career in play and orchestra. This is the stuff you got to have. Um, before, yeah, I've got like maybe two questions worth it. Yes, please. That's a very interesting point, because Greg was talking about use, the use of vibrato in, um, in the section like this, the first player kind of setting the tone and the others not drilling too much underneath. That's, that's got to be something that, that, that's one of those things by example, yeah? That's one of those things that, that you set, absolutely. Other question? Yes? Doctor, and you've been under many conductors. Can you think I'll correct that. I'm a semi conductor. Well, <laughs> <laughs> um, can you think about? I read about like Duda Bell in LA and you know, things about Sandy. What characteristics under that you've had an outstanding conductor or performance? How does that feel? Or what, what do wow. they do? Great question. What is it that makes a conductor a, a favorite, someone that you look for? But, First of all, number one, sincerity. I want to feel that, that what they're wanting me to do comes from a place of thought, combination of thought and heart that is for real. It's not manufactured. It's not something you might have read out of a book or, or, or whatever, that it really comes from. from. That's why I think the prejudice for, for most orchestras is they like conductors who have been around a little while. I mean, look, the, the, the kids need experience too, so we kind of help them along. But uh, I, I think we, we love the experience because those, they know, first of all, how to get it, and also what it is that they want you to get. And they also have the best stories too. <laughs> <laughs> yes, Mark. When, when I listened to, to different orchestras growing up, there was a very pronounced difference between New York and Boston. Yeah. And, and it, it was It's changed, yeah. Mark, Mark, Mark is, is asking about how, how orchestras have changed in terms of the way that they sound. Like Boston used to have its style because there were so many French that were, that, that were in there. Philadelphia was all Italian. New York was Russian and Italian. Uh, Chicago was German. And all of these orchestras, all these Broad, very, very specific, uh, quantifiable styles to it. It's not so much. I'll, I'll end with this little story. Uh, I was driving somewhere and I was uh, listening. I had, I had on the, the classical music station, and they had on uh, La Valse. No, excuse me, excuse me. With uh, sources of pressure. <laughs> and so, you know, when you, when you've been in the, this game as long as I have. You play the game of, okay, so what orchestra is this? Or can we figure it out? And, and I couldn't feel what orchestra, so I said, okay, this is, this is either a, a British or, or American orchestra, uh, not one of the big ones, whatever. Okay. I just about drove off the road when the announcer said that that was Ricard uh, Petit Sorcier with the Orchestra Paris. I said, what? Are you telling me that I, in the, in the 21st century, no longer discern a French orchestra playing French music. It was, it, it just, it didn't have, so, so, so I'll just blame the conductor. <laughs> <laughs> and you know, well I say that I'm, I'm kind of teasing, but you know, it does sort of come from there. De toi, de toi, when you play for, for de toi, 
he could make you sound like a French orchestra. You know, so so really, again, you see, that's why we like to experience ones. They really bring, uh, um, yeah, they really bring great ideas. Hey, this is a, a pleasure. I hope that you do check out this this site because there's way more stuff. We play Fed, we play Don Quixote, we play I tell them where, um, I, I mean, it's it's really a what the most fun project I think. And by the way. Wasn't that some kick butt section playing with yeah. people out there? And Matt Soderborn playing third. When you get this, the first thing I want you to listen to is the box. It is some of the most scary, freaky, wonderful third trumpet playing I've, I've ever heard, honestly. Um, it, it really gets and, and Jeff Work, that beautiful low solo, that was Jeff Work in Pleasant Symphony playing that. That, that's the other beautiful thing, is playing something we really don't know who's playing. That's when you know you've got something. So um, I thank the ITG for asking me to come do this. I thank you all for coming <coughs> here at the absurd hour of 8.45 in the morning to hear this. Um, and go and do great stuff, folks. You, you're around a lot of things that I hope will inspire you. Check out the, the exhibits on, on these folks. And, See what you get out of it, okay? Thanks so much.